Hello everyone, I hope you are all well. Um, the purpose of this video is to, to look at the analysis of normal force and its impact on static friction and kinetic friction. So there was a previous video posted where I demonstrated where this uh, data was um, generated. So just a quick review of that. Um, I had a lightweight plastic sled and I added 500 gram increments of mass. Um, so the sled itself was 20 grams. So I added 20 grams to each of those uh, masses to get the total mass of the object. Although I didn't actually run the experiment, um, if the sled mass or the object had a mass of zero, um, that would also mean that there's no gravitational pull on it. It would not be pushing into the surface, so its normal force would be zero. And if there's no interaction between the surface and the object, there would not be any friction. That interaction is what causes friction. So I did add a zero, zero data point um, so that we could incorporate that into our data. So really what we had here was increasing the mass inside the sled by 500 grams. Um, next column just converts those values to kilograms, right? There's a thousand grams in a kilogram, so um, those values hopefully make sense. The next column is the calculated weight, meaning the force of gravity on each object um, in Newton. So we remember that uh, the way that we calculate that is we take the kilogram mass times 9.8 Newtons per kilogram. That's the value of g acceleration uh, due to gravity to get the Newton weight. So I didn't actually like put these on a, a scale and measure them, but these were calculated values. I do want to note in this case, because the surface was uh, horizontal, the weight of the object is also going to equal the normal force. Um, we're going to focus on normal force because that's really what describes the interaction between an object and the surface it's resting on. Um, and I want to note that the weight of an object and the normal force are not always equal. Um, for example, if we put the object on an incline, um, its weight would not equal normal force. Um, and when we do analyze uh, frictional effects, we want to look at normal force. Another case where the weight might not equal normal force is if you have an object and you push it downward, um, you would increase the normal force because you're pushing that object into the surface with more force and the surface is pushing back with more force. If you lift the object, say, um, that, or at least partially lift, the normal force would decrease um, by the opposite reason. So we do want to focus on normal forces really controlling um, static friction and kinetic friction. And so these were measured values um, from a graph that looked like this. Um, the kinetic friction was basically the average force measured while it was being moved at steady speed. And then the um, maximum static friction was that peak that we saw before the object moved. So when I started to pull on the heaviest object, the friction really spiked and it went to some maximum and then I was able to move it and the fric uh, friction amount dropped down to a roughly constant value. There's a little bit of fluctuation here, um, but we saw that in each case. We go up to a spike, that's the maximum static friction, and then that leveling off is the force while I was pulling it at steady speed. So what I want to do is treat normal force as the independent variable, the thing that I purposefully, chain, purposefully changed by adding mass to the sled. And I'm going to look at each of these um, as the dependent variable, the thing that depended on more normal, more normal force. The more normal force there was, the more friction we saw. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just do a quick copy of these cells into a new sheet so we can have a fresh uh, fresh fresh sheet to look at um, so here we go and let me try that again there we go um, let me make it a little bit bigger so you can see it And for the purposes of graphing, I'm really only concerned with normal force. So I'm going to delete that down. Um, 
the others are fine. So let me resize that. So I do want normal force on the x-axis, so that is what I would like to put um, on uh, my column A. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight that data. Now I'm going to go ahead and graph these in the same graph. So because the normal force amount was the same for each of these trials, um, when you graph two columns at once, it should um, pull in different colored data points and, and you can analyze them uh, separately. So let me go ahead and insert chart. And it did recognize it as a scatter chart, that's nice. Take a look at this graph down here. And it is graphing the static friction maximum in blue and the kinetic friction in red. So um, I am going to want to do two separate analyses for these. You can see where the data points fall and it is looking um, quite linear. So let me just go over here to customize. And let me see if I can add Trying to find a vertical axis label. That's okay, we'll go ahead without it. Oh, here we go, that's what I want. Um, vertical axis. And I'll call this static friction max. So um, just looking at the data, there's also a blue data point here. They're kind of right on top of each other, so we can't see it. They do look linear. So the next step would be to um, insert that linear trend line, go back to customize. If you don't remember, that's under the series tab. I want to click trend line, and then for my label, I want to use equation. And there we have it. So it has put a trend line on. We can see that the data points um, fall fairly close to that line, especially on that kinetic friction. I think I mentioned that the static friction value is a little bit tricky, and you really should do multiple trials to get a more consistent value. But I'm satisfied with um, how these data points are falling uh, relative to the line. So of course, what we want to do next is make sense of these linear equations. Um, the first thing I would note is the intercept values. Um, close to 0 0.2, I want 0 0.16, uh, 168 for the static friction maximum. Just by the um, eyeball test, um, I would say that it sure looks like those lines are trending through zero. Considering the biggest static friction was eight and the intercept is about you know less than 0.2, um, we can definitely just drop that intercept and assume that the actual intercept is zero. So we want to focus on the um, slope value here in coming up with an equation. So let's talk about the static friction maximum equation first. So of course these don't show it, but it's y equals mx plus b, slope times x variable plus intercept. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of type some notes here as we go. So the y variable that we're uh, studying here for static friction maximum, of course, is the static friction maximum. And it equals the slope. I'm going to go ahead and keep 
all three digits. Um, we could debate whether we really knew it to that much accuracy. Um, and we want to think about the slope units. So again, a slope, probably the first definition you learned is rise over run. Um, rise is measured in newtons, and the run is measured in newtons. That's a first. Um, so the units are actually newtons per newton. Um, so it turns out that this slope value, which we're going to end up calling the coefficient of friction, is actually um, referred to as unitless. Just like in math class, if you had a over a or x over x or 7 over 7, you can actually cancel the unit. Um, I want to leave it there for a moment um, because I do want to take a, a, a look at what it really means to say that the units are newtons per newton. Um, so I'll come back to that in a moment. But that's the, the slope term. And then that gets multiplied by the x variable, which is the normal force. Okay, so um, I don't know why I keep losing my m's there. Um, so what we have is an equation that would allow us to plug in a normal force value for this plastic sled that we were using and calculate or estimate what the static friction maximum is. Um, it term, turns out that we, like I said, we call this coefficient of friction. Um, it is unique for any two surfaces. So this is only going to be valid for that particular plastic sled on a lab tabletop. Um, different objects obviously have different frictional amounts. So something that has a lot of friction, you would expect a bigger coefficient of friction. The multiplier is bigger, meaning the same amount of normal force is actually going to give you a bigger static friction minimum. So let me come back for a second and look at this newtons per newton, since that is kind of strange. I want to think about the rise unit. It is measured in newtons, but it's newtons of friction, in this case static friction, over newtons, but what I'm measuring here is normal force. So if I'm being very, very particular about what I'm actually measuring, again, this, um, this slope unit is newtons of friction, in this case, static friction. Let me get a little bit messy here. Over newtons of normal force. Just to differentiate, I'll make that outer parentheses a bracket. So this whole thing in brackets is the slope. 0 0.391 newtons of friction per newtons of normal force times normal force. That is the equation that would allow me to calculate the static friction maximum for this particular surface combination at any normal force, Okay, assuming the trend holds. Um, so let's then look at what the kinetic friction equation is telling us this one here again I think we can safely say that the intercept is actually zero um, without any normal force we wouldn't expect any friction um, so let me just kind of again type my notes here for the kinetic friction relationship so kinetic friction here for this particular surface Again, I'm going to use brackets here for the whole slope. So the whole slope is going to go um, inside these brackets. So um, again, what I'm measuring on the um, y-axis, the rise, is going to be newtons of friction. So here, notice the values less. which isn't the best, but I'm trying to make it uh, make sense here. So newtons of friction, 2.96 newtons of friction per newton of normal force. 
that's the slope. And of course it gets multiplied then by the x-axis variable, which here again is normal force. So again, what that's telling me for this particular surface, um, I can plug in any normal force, multiply it by this coefficient, and it's going to tell me how many newtons of kinetic friction I can expect. Um, kinetic friction, uh, the coefficient of kinetic friction, which again is a name for this slope, is always, um, I'm not going to say always, but nearly always less than the static friction maximum. Because once something gets moving, the, um, the fact that the surfaces are already kind of sliding past one another decreases the friction. And again, we saw that um, in the graphs where we went to a peak static friction maximum and then the kinetic friction was a roughly constant value um, after that. So um, again, just a couple of notes. The um, slopes here, we call them coefficients of friction. They're unique to any combination of surfaces. If you have a very um, low friction surface, you would expect a small coefficient of friction. You would expect very few newtons of friction per newton of normal force. Some, uh, some surfaces that have more friction would have bigger coefficients of friction because you're going to expect more newtons of friction, um, uh, more newtons of friction for every one newton of normal force. Now I do want to go ahead and just s simplify these equations a little bit because it is newtons per newtons. It, it literally is um, okay to dilute, uh, delete the units, and I want to explain why that would work in this case. It's really one of the few cases in physics where we have a, a unitless quantity. So that newtons per newton, again, it, it cancels out. And I'm just going to go ahead and show you the really simplified version of this equation, and I think it'll even make more sense. Um, so what we've done now is we can say I can plug in a normal force of interest for these two surfaces. Um, it's going to have units of newtons already. So if I multiply it by a unitless quantity, I get the static friction maximum still in newtons. There's no cancellation of units. Likewise for kinetic friction. Plug in a normal force value in newtons, multiply by a unitless number, and you're going to get a value um, for the kinetic friction um, in newtons. We don't need to add uh, any units into that. So hopefully that helps you make sense of this. There's a follow-up reading that will um, also help you out with this. And again, I hope everyone's well, and uh, see you soon.